I understand the press need a few extra minutes to set up. Is that correct? Because I was ready at 1.15. I just wanted you to know. I, I was ready. I, I know you needed a few extra minutes. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I've, I've been joined by our great Commissioner of Labor, Roberta Reardon, who you'll be hearing from at the end of the presentation. Also, um, two great individuals, three great individuals who I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, our majority, Deputy Majority Leader of the Senate, Mike Gianaris, and I want to thank him in advance for uh, his efforts to secure, secu make sure that our work sites are safe, as well as uh, Assembly Member Karina Reyes, who doubles as a nurse during a pandemic, as well as a legislator, and what an extraordinary individual she is. Also, the leader of labor for New York State, uh, Mario Salento. Uh, we wish him happy Labor Day week, but also thank him for his uh, very intense involvement with us to make sure that we ensure safety for our workers in, in, during a pandemic as they get back to work. So I wanted to recognize them. Just a few hours ago, literally an hour and a half ago, I was walking the grounds of the 9-11 Memorial and the museum there with former mayor of New York City, Mike Bloomberg. And as I was there, I was reflecting on the moments 20 years ago but not just what happened on 9-11, we'll be speaking much more about this over the next few days, but what happened afterward. And I took such inspiration from how New York pulled together and showed their resiliency and truly built back stronger and better than ever before. And that is actually where we are today. As we continue our response to dealing with the pandemic, which is still very much with us, it's how we respond to it and how we react and how we go forth is how we'll be judged 20 years from now, just as we're looking back at this milestone after 9-11. And what we've seen is you know, quite extraordinary. You know, New Yorkers coming together in all walks of life as selling members, working in hospitals, uh, the first responders, the essential workers. We can never give them enough gratitude for what they've done. And we'll find ways to honor them as we go forth. But we were the hardest hit. You know this story well. I'm not telling you something we all didn't live through. And the question is um, where we are today. And I wanted to give you a snapshot of our numbers and what we're seeing and what we're concerned about and what we're feeling better about. And there's not a single person who wants to have that bad flashback or relive that horror show we experienced last year. And all of us are absolutely 100% committed to ensuring that we do everything in our power to continue this battle. Uh, I feel like we're always in battle mode. Last week it was Mother Nature we were battling and now we're fighting uh, the forces of nature again that have seem unrelenting in this pandemic as more variants emerge. So I just wanted to let you know exactly where we are. Let's start getting a quick assessment of the numbers. It's all about the numbers, my friends. We're watching the numbers like a hawk. And just wanted to let you see by region, the numbers are starting to creep up again. Uh, statewide, we're at 3.34. Western New York, where I live, is popping up there, Mohawk Valley, uh, Central New York, some of the numbers that we're concerned about. Not unlike we went through last year. And we're always going to continue raising the question, what is different by region? Uh, why are some areas doing better than others? And what can be done uh, to take us to a better place? All the above. So all those numbers start trending downwards. So uh, you can see this, the regional breakdown and as well as our, our overall positivity, the seven-day average. Quick look at New York City, uh, Manhattan uh, being the lowest, 1.66%. When I will tell you, I see everybody on the street wearing masks. That says to me. Uh, mask work. I know mask work. We have evidence to prove it, but also I believe that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Manhattan is doing better. Staten Island, I just was there a couple of days ago surveying storm damage, and the numbers are creeping up toward 4%. And so we want to make sure that people are aware of these numbers and uh, the consequences of this and what this means. Daily hospitalizations, this is what we look at closer than anything because the question is do we have the capacity in our hospitals to handle? situations where people not just contract COVID, but also succumb to it and need hospitalization. And why there's such tension here is that what we're seeing, and you saw the news this morning, other parts of our country, where they're actually denying life-saving health care to individuals who have non-COVID illnesses because the capacity uh, is not there in the hospitals. We were on the verge of that last year, uh, fought back hard won that battle and the hospitals that stepped up and increased their capacity, the surge efforts that were undertaken under the emergency order last year. We know how to handle this if it happens again. So you'll watch the numbers here. Our daily hospitalizations uh, are much lower than they had been, 
But this could change overnight. This could change very quickly. And I want to thank our, our hospital partners and everyone involved and those who are continuing to ensure we have adequate supply of PPE. The biggest challenge for our hospitals is not the PPE. It's not the beds. Just like last year, it's staffing. Staffing is not what we need. And we have to do everything we can to encourage people. And I think just like after 9-11, so many people signed up to go into the military and go into uh, become a firefighter, or law enforcement, because they were so inspired by the actions of those who showed the utmost courage on that day. Similarly, I think there's a lot of people who are now inspired to go into the health services, health care, hospital workers, transport, EMTs. But the problem is they're just not online yet. It takes time for some young person who says, I now want to be a doctor or a nurse because I want to be on that front line, uh, not unlike 9-11. It just takes time for the training. You went through the training, you know what I'm talking about. So the bottom line is it's just all about getting vaccinated and wearing the mask. There's nothing brand new about how we're going to deal with this next phase. It's all about uh, having the resources and the tools and the weapons. And we didn't have a vaccination a year ago. We didn't have a vaccination basically widespread until last January, February. I didn't get mine until March. We did it by age. So we have so much more at our disposal this time, and we're in a better shape, and that's why the hospitalizations are troubling. But if we can keep them from spiking upwards, we're going to be, in a, in, we're going to be okay. Um, let's see. Hospitalizations overall, 445 uh, back then. Now we have uh, daily hospitalizations, 24, 15. So that's been a spike since last year, but it's again, how are the hospitals handling it? We have five times the number we had last year. Let's look at our overall hospital capacity. I'm looking at this bottom line right here. Statewide, 36% beds available, ICU 26. That is manageable today. I talked to the leaders of hospitals. They can handle that today, but we have to make sure that it does not creep much beyond that or else we'll have to take more dramatic action to increase bed capacity and, and they know what to do. They've done this before. So we stand ready to trigger whatever we have to do to activate uh, more capacity. We're not there yet, but it's something we're watching. Vaccination rate, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. Uh, you know, you look at the CDC numbers, and those may wonder why the difference between state numbers initially and CDC numbers. CDC calculates everybody in the state, people who are in military installations and are in our federal prisons. So it actually, there are more people in the state who are vaccinated than had been demonstrated for. So I'm going to go with the CDC numbers and show that 18%, uh, I'm sorry, 81% of people over 18 have had at least one dose. That's very good news. Uh, news. Uh, children a little lower, but they were just starting off uh, later than adults, so they're at 61 percent. Completed vaccine series. This is what it's all about, my friends, getting it done. And for people who think they're okay with one, please help us get the word out. It's not one and done. You are still vulnerable if you've only had one in your series. If you're in the, and I, I know some have had, had uh, the vaccine, it only requires one dose. But if you had Moderna or Pfizer, you need to get that second dose done. So we're at about 73% for the completed doses and 50% for young people uh, 12 to 17. So another area we need to improve right here, vaccination. Trend line of vaccinations, uh, we're better than the nation. We're better than large states, but uh, I'm very competitive. I like to be number one in everything we do, and I want to see that uh, number go up. And I believe we'll get there. We have more vaccine requirements, which I'll talk about in, uh, in uh, education and in the workplace, and we'll make sure that we uh, continue in the right trajectory there. So where are we at? The Delta variant, still very much a with us, a threat, but the vaccines are holding. The vaccines are holding against the Delta variant, which is something we weren't quite sure at the very beginning. The vaccines are working. That is the best news we have. A uh, lot of attentions on these breakthrough cases, and I wanted to know the numbers of how many cases are breakthrough. People that have been fully vaccinated who are exposed to the virus who end up uh, uh, contracting COVID or testing positive. And that's only 0.5% of the fully vaccinated population. And when you think about those who are succumb to this and have to be in a hospital, it's 0.04% of the fully vaccinated population. So it is still a rarity. It is still a rarity. But this still now requires us to go back to being much more vigilant about mask wearing and even the hand washing and the social distancing. We have to go back to the beginning 
and continue to use those to help us fight back against this so we don't have those numbers increase any more than they are. Next stop, booster shots. We are waiting for the federal government to permit these. Uh, they've told us September 20th, Pfizer first, Moderna to Ferro. I just spoke with executives at Pfizer the other day to see how they're moving along. We're looking very good. And they don't think we're going to have any 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 capacity issue or volume. We're going to have plenty of vaccines, which is great news. You remember last year, uh, actually earlier this year, when the vaccines were first available, it was like the Hunger Games. Everybody was trying to get the vaccines. There were not enough available. This is a very good news dynamic right now. There will be plenty of vaccines available for people to get the booster shots. Certainly the people who had them first. Eight months is the time where you need to start getting uh, set up for your, for your booster shot. So last December, we had people in nursing homes, uh, congregate settings, hospitals, more people were getting elderly. And then we started getting more, the larger percentage of the population in March and April and certainly into May. So we know that there's going to be a spike in the number of people who are now eligible. We've hit that eight-month mark, and we need to be ready for that. So what we've done, you heard my philosophy early on. There's two approaches to dealing with this. One is where the state comes in, sets up the testing sites, does everything. That's one path. The other one is you have that available, you do it when necessary, but you also empower the local governments because all of them train for this. The local health departments and the county administrators and the county executives, they do nothing but train for this year round. They are ready for this. They've done flus, they've been Zika, they've done every other virus that's been out there and they want to be engaged. This is what I heard loud and clear when I was out there in the trenches in Western New York with all these people seven days a week on phone calls. They say, let us do our jobs, deploy us. That's what I want to do. I want to have the state available to backfill, uh, give surge capacity, give extra assistance, and we're here to help like this. But let, let, let's let the locals do what they want to do and do it best uh, with guidance and requirements from the state. So we're going to give $65 million to local health departments to help support their efforts, as well as work with our providers and our long care facilities, and also pop-up sites. We know this worked. It's not always about the mass vaccination site. It's not always about the drive-through. It's about targeted approaches to go right into neighborhoods and communities, and we're gonna continue doing that as well. We know it works. We know it works. That trusted partner, someone in the community that they recognize or know from their church or their senior center or their veterans post. You've heard about the Mu variant. Um, we're watching it. I've been in contact with our New York State Lab, Wadsworth, uh, world-renowned for the individuals there, and I want to thank them once again for all they do for us every day. And we've seen that that's less than 0.5% of the cases in New York thus far. We know it originated in Ecuador and Colombia. And the federal guidelines, which we were in constant contact with the CDC, they tell us right now it's not an immediate threat. There was some early reports that it might be uh, resistant to vaccines. That has not been established, but if that's the case, uh, it could be problematic, and I want you to know we're, we're on top of that as well, as are, I'm sure, the pharmaceuticals preparing to deal with that. Where are we today? Two things most important on people's minds. You're a parent. All you're thinking about is school. Get the kids back to school, but get them back to school safely, and that's what we've been focused on for a long time, a long time, starting with uh, literally the uh, day before I became governor. I had a call with all the leadership of the education, the school superintendents, the school boards, the school administrators, the county leaders, everyone involved who touches the whole education ecosystem. And I talked to them about where we are and what we can do collaboratively to make sure that teachers and staff and above all the children are safe so they can go back. I don't believe remote working is an option anymore. We will continue to work against that wherever possible, except for children who are immunocompromised and absolutely need to have an option, and we need to make sure that they don't fall behind. But the vast minor majority of children, they need to get back into an environment where they can thrive again, they can be a child again, they can learn with their friends, they can just try to put this whole last year and a half behind them and just start learning again. And that's something that is so desperately needed, and, and the psychological impacts on these children has been dire. It really is. You cannot overstate what young people have gone through, children all the way up to teenagers, that isolation, the distancing from their friends and their normal networks. It's taken a real toll, and we're going to be dealing with that for a long time. And we need to continue making sure that we have 
uh, mental health services and support for these, for these families and children. But in the meantime, we have to get them back, but give parents the confidence that their precious child is going to be safe when they leave their home and go off to school. So we have instituted a universal mask requirement, regardless of whether you're vaccinated. It's simple, it's safe, and it makes sense. Also, we've issued just recently DOH guidelines. We are prioritizing in-person learning. We have very detailed recommendations for the school districts to execute on physical distancing and quarantine protocols, helping them know. I've heard this from school superintendents. They say, don't leave all this to us. We are educators. We're not healthcare professionals. Tell us what needs to be done based on your knowledge of the science, the data, and the facts. And also weekly testing of uh, all, all school personnel. We want school personnel vaccinated. That is my number one priority. As an option, we'll let them test out and they'll have to have weekly testing. But it's my sincere hope that everyone will agree with this. But people need to know the vast majority of teachers are already vaccinated. That should give comfort to parents uh, who are concerned about their children's exposure to another adult. The vast majority are, and I want to thank them for stepping up and doing not just what's right for them and their own families, but what's good for the children that will be before them uh, when school starts. But we will have the opt-out um, option available. But I also want to see many more young people vaccinated. And until we get the vaccine approved for 5 to 12, we still have some lagging numbers between the ages of 12 and 17. You can see that uh, we have 61% of young people between 12 and 17 have had at least one dose. It's not bad, but it's not great. And you can see how that goes by population. Uh, 65 plus are absolutely the ones who understand this, but we are worried about the children who need to be vaccinated in that age group right now. So we're gonna continue, we'll be announcing some more initiatives to get, that, uh, get those young people motivated. Uh, fully vaccinated is only about 50%. So of the pool of people who could be vaccinated in this age group, we only have the job halfway done. I'm calling on parents. I'm calling on anyone who can influence this process to say, please, if you want to make sure your children are safe as they're going out, not just in the classroom, but they're out there playing sports and they're out in the community and they're socializing with their friends, only 50% is not where it needs to be. We have to make sure that that gets higher. We're gonna be announcing some initiatives on that as well. So we have to do better, my friends. Uh, so we are announcing what we're calling Vax to School. Vax to School. And first of all, it's gonna be a state-funded digital marketing campaign to reinforce the messages that I'm giving you today. And we'll have a site, a micro site, which is where everything is in one location for parents and guardians to know what to do ready-made resources for schools and localities to host these events, literally taking the vehicles to the schools and making it easier. We're going to be announcing the list of schools where this will be occurring very soon. So we're going to make it easy on you. We'll have a digital channel. We'll have uh, available on Instagram. And it's just all about making, prioritizing the health of our, our teachers, our administrators, and our children so we get that sense of security that parents will need when they say goodbye to their child and send them off to school. And we're going to be announcing the pop the pop up sites very shortly. So school, working on that, workplace next, and a lot's been done. I want to thank everyone who's been involved in this from the very beginning, uh, particularly our friends in labor, who represent the people who are the most exposed, the people who've had to not have the luxury of sitting home necessarily in front of their laptop working remotely. Many of them did not have that option. And they were willing to, whether they were healthcare workers or grocery store workers, pharmacists or transit workers, teachers, countless others who still continue to this day to have to show up regardless of whether the variant is high or it's low. And that's, that's a challenge we're facing. So we have to make the workplace itself a safer environment. So what we've done is there are already some vaccination requirements in place, state employees, they are required to be vaccinated or else they can have weekly testing and that starts, uh, that has to be in place by October 12th. Healthcare workers, uh, these are the ones that are most exposed to the virus. We have to make sure that they're protected as well as people they come in contact. They have to be vaccinated and we have a deadline of September 25th for uh, people in these entities. And I know that this is problem problematic. I recognize this because we're having a shortage of workers in these healthcare facilities. And many of them are vaccinated. I thank them, but we have to encourage more people to get vaccinated so they can be in their workplace and we get back to normal and take care of people uh, who are sick or who are in these various facilities. SUNY students, 
this has been great. They're, they're back on campus, uh, no alternative, and there's been great compliance. And I want to thank uh, the SUNY administration and all others who've been involved in this. It's working very, very well. CUNY students, the same thing. MTA and Port Authority, we're going to be uh, requiring vaccinations of all workers, and there will be a weekly testing opt-out. But again, just get the vaccine. Why do you want to get tested every single week? It's not fun. I've had it done countless times. The vaccine, one prick and you're done. Come back in two weeks, get another one, you're done again, and then you don't have to worry about the weekly testing. So I'm encouraging all these workers to follow uh, the vaccination protocols and just get it done. Um, one way we were able to increase my confidence that the workplaces around New York State are going to be safe was the New York HERO Act. And I want to make sure that this is explained, that people understand how significant this is. This was signed last spring, last May. It never had the teeth. It didn't have the enforcement, in which case uh, it wasn't really being, uh, it wasn't operational. And what it does is that it mandates that all workplaces have enforceable protocols that we mandate health and safety protections, including health screenings, masks, physical distancing, cleaning and disinfection, and personal protective equipment. And there are many, everyone thinks, well, that's already happening. No, there are many workplaces where people, the employers, the operators of the work site did not take it seriously, and they were not doing this, and they were not properly protecting workers across the state of New York. And so there are some individuals who are the heroes of the HERO Act. And I want to thank, again, AFL-CIO President Mario Salento, Senate Deputy Leader Mike Gianaris, and Assemblymember Karina Reyes for her work. And again, as a healthcare professional, she knows how important this is. And I want to allow them a few minutes to say a few words. But when this is all done, um, I want to be able to, this pan when we declare an end to this pandemic, I want to be able to look back and say there was not one thing that we should have done that we didn't do. And this HERO Act is part of that strategy. We know that the Delta variant is continuing to rage. We have conditions in workplaces where people are feeling anxious and insecure. And the thing we need to do is unleash the full potential of the New York City and New York State economy. It has been suppressed. It's been this induced coma for far too long. And now it's time to come back. But come back to safe schools, come back to safe workplaces, and start letting the world know we're back. With this vaccination and the rates that we have in New York, it is a safe time to come visit, to uh, enjoy all that is great about New York State, New York City. I'll be out there myself promoting some of our various industries and letting people know that I feel comfortable with what we've done up till now and the number of people who've been vaccinated. Thank you, New Yorkers, for getting vaccinated. Thank you for continuing to wear your mask. And thank you to our champions of the HERO Act. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Gianaris and invite him to come up and say a few words. So this is what this room looks like. <laughs> uh, what a refreshing change to have a, a governor that actually uh, seeks the input of others and is collaborative in her approach. Uh, and in just the first couple of weeks, Governor Ogle, you have uh, shown that uh, you do uh, that and so much more. So thank you uh, for that. Um, and thank you for implementing uh, the HERO Act. This is a law that um, simply requires a certification that we are in the midst of a highly contagious communicable disease that presents a serious risk of harm to public health. Now, I don't think you could find a single person that would disagree with the notion that we are facing that more than at any time in our lifetimes, uh, more than any time in over 100 years. Uh, and yet, since May when this law was enacted and June when it took full effect, we couldn't get the Department of Health to certify that we were in the midst of a pandemic. Um, through Governor Hochul's leadership, we now have reached that point and these important protections fall into place. Uh, we can have greater confidence that our workers who did so much to get us through the early months of the pandemic at great cost to themselves and their families will have greater protections in place. A lot of businesses already provide the basic protections we have all become familiar with and they probably won't have to change a thing. Just keep doing the responsible thing. But there were plenty that were not doing that. And those that worked when those, some of us had the luxury of staying home suffered for it. Well, from this point forward, uh, that will no longer be the case. Uh, and that's because Governor Hochul has insisted that our Department of Health make this certification um, and that our workplaces are safe, not only for the employees, but also for the customers for public-facing businesses. Um, that we can enter 
uh, places, continue to get the economy back on track, continue to get New York working again uh, with greater confidence that we won't be putting our lives at risk uh, while doing so. Um, and so that is a, a wonderful thing that we're here to celebrate today. Uh, one last thing I'll mention about uh, the HERO Act, which is very important. It also empowers the workers themselves to monitor uh, and report violations of the process. If you have a bad employer that's not providing uh, the protections, how exactly are we going to know that unless we let the workers uh, monitor and make reports about, um, about uh, things that are not happening as they should um, in the workplace? So um, the governor mentioned her back to school plan, which is, which is great. The back to work plan also now is going into effect. Um, between the two of them, I think we will accelerate our recovery from this awful moment in history. So, Governor, thanks again. And thank you to my co-sponsor, Karina Reyes, and to Mara Salento and our friends in labor for all their great leadership. Assignment member Karina Reyes, and also if you want to just give a few reflections on what it was like to be a nurse during the pandemic and how you're feeling today. Thank you, Governor. Um, it is quite a change, a refreshing change uh, of tone from where we were a few months ago. And without your leadership and your designation of making COVID a highly infectious communicable disease, we would not be able to fully implement the New York HERO Act. Um, we were talking backstage uh, with Mario about my experience uh, in the hospital during the height of the pandemic. Um, and having a ran out of ventilators and what that feeling was like, uh, the fear in, in our patients' eyes right before we intubated them and the fear uh, of all the staff, the hospital staff, when we potentially were running out of equipment to save another life. Um, and we don't want to be there ever again. Uh, and all the measures that you have put in place are leading us to a point where we can fully recover and we thank you for that. Um, uh, I did have prepared remarks, so I'll read them. Uh, so I'm, pr <laughs> I'm proud to stand with you uh, as we witness the full implementation of the New York HERO Act. Uh, New York State is actually leading the way uh, in the first of its kind airborne infectious disease protocols. Um, workers and businesses in our state have been waiting since May for clear guidance from the Departments of Labor and Health on how to properly protect their employees and customers from COVID-19. With its full implementation in place, the New York HERO Act will better prepare establishments to defend against rising threats like the Delta variant that grow more prevalent each day. We know this pandemic is not over. Although our efforts to increase vaccination levels have been fruitful, we know that we still need more active countermeasures to fully contain the virus. We must provide businesses with robust industry-specific safety protocols to stop the spread and keep our states open. And that's exactly what the New York Hero Act does. It allows them to create very specific industry-specific uh, protocols for each uh, uh, industry. Today marks the beginning of our state's proactive approach to ensuring we are prepared in the wake of future diseases transmissible through the air or respiratory droplets. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, the labor unions and worker organizations that supported this legislation to protect their workers, such as the RWDSU, the New York State Nurses Association, the New York State AFL-CIO, 1199 SEIU, CWA District 1. And I also want to thank the advocacy groups that supported the legislation, as well as Align, Forward.us, and the Legal Aid Society, New York Communities for Change, the New York Nail Salon Workers Association, and the New York Immigration Coalition. Finally, I commend Governor Hochul for recognizing this need and look forward to adopting the safety protocols in the near future. Thank you again. Uh, next, we'll hear from Mario Salento, who no, needs no introduction, but he is the president of the New York State AFL-CIO. <clears throat> thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to thank the, the sponsors, both of you. Uh, Really, uh, your dedication and commitment to this issue uh, was inspiring to everyone. We did a few uh, Zoom press conferences. We were talking about that earlier in the other room, and, and you could see the passion from both of you through the screen, and we know how difficult that is when you do the Zoom meeting. So I thank you both for shepherding this legislation through and getting it, and getting it to, to the governor's first signature. So thank you both. Uh, governor, I, I just want to say that 
on behalf of the two and a half million union members in the state that I have the honor to represent, really on behalf of all working men and women in this state from Buffalo to Brooklyn to Long Island, first thank you for implementing the HERO Act. More importantly, thank you for making the health, the safety, and the well-being of working men and women in this state a priority. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we've talked about it, that, um, you know, we're in this, still in the midst of the pandemic, but when the pandemic first came underway and, you know, we've heard all the stories about essential workers and, and we know that they risk themselves, their health, their well-being, and the health and well-being of their families throughout the height of the pandemic. And we owe them a debt of gratitude that we will never be able to repay. Let's just be clear. We'll never be able to repay them for it, but we do thank them to the best of our ability. We're still in this. And for the labor movement, well before we ever heard what COVID is, before we knew of a pandemic and what it would mean, we've always had a feeling that all workers are essential, regardless of who you are or where you're from, whatever your job title is. All workers are essential, A, to their employers, to their coworkers, to their communities, and most importantly, on a human level, they are essential to their families, the people they come home to every night. And they were in harm's way as well. All you want when you have a loved one, friend, family member, whatever, who goes to work every day, you want them to come home in the same condition from which they left that morning. Governor, by implementing the HERO Act, you will help to ensure that millions of, Mer of New Yorkers across this state will come home in the same condition from which they left in the morning, and I thank you for that. And two weeks ago, when, when you took office, you made mention of how you wanted to collaborate, how you wanted to bring people together. Um, and that resonated with a lot of people. It certainly resonated with me, but also in the labor movement, we have this um, thought and this thought uh, process that actions speak louder than words. Um, I will just say that in these past two weeks, your actions have far surpassed anything that we could have hoped for, and they speak volumes to who you are, what you believe in, and, and everything that makes you a leader. And I wanna thank you for that because it is very heartening to be with you and to talk to you and bringing people, and I know we've spoken many times, but you've spoken with other leaders, you've spoken with advocacy groups, and you've had the courage of your convictions to act upon what you believed in immediately. And that set a tone for this entire state, and I thank you for that. And the last thing is, is simply this, and, and it was mentioned, Mike mentioned it just a moment ago, you know, whether it's a restaurant or a hotel or um, uh, a retail outlet or a supermarket, we all come into contact with all of these workers every single day. You can't walk into a supermarket and not come into contact with the person stocking the shelves. And you can't, you know, walk into, a, a, into Macy's and not interact with the salesperson. You can't walk in the street and not run into a sanitation worker or take your children to school this week and run into a teacher or an aide or a security guard. The fact is, Governor, by implementing the HERO Act, 19 million New Yorkers in this state are safer today than they were two days ago and that's because of you. And I thank you for that. And again, I thank you for having the courage of your convictions to fight for what you believe in, to implement this law, and I thank you for bringing everyone together because the issues of the labor movement, I can tell, align with how you feel about working men and women, understanding their needs and concerns, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. So those are the heroes of the HERO Act, and I want to thank uh, all of you for your leadership. And uh, with that, we'll conclude this portion of our event to present our latest statistics and information on where we are with the pandemic, and we'll return shortly. Thank you.
I also make sure that everyone knows our wonderful Commissioner of Labor, Roberta Reardon, who's been really in the trenches, and I thank her for his, her incredible work, extraordinary work, to her and her department uh, during the early days of the pandemic and making sure that people had the lifeline to keep them going, uh, keep food on the table, keep uh, shelter over their heads, and you were just were so incredible during that whole experience. And also for your work uh, shoulder to shoulder with me to make sure that we do everything we can to protect the workplaces of individuals so they feel, again, it's all about the psyche of New Yorkers. Do you feel comfortable enough to go into your workplace and to resume some semblance of normally, normalcy you know, with the vaccination, with the mask, and with the proper protocols in place, because that's the only way we're going to be able to pull back this city and this state and to let us uh, unleash the whole economic power that, as I mentioned, has been suppressed too long. So uh, with that, I'll take a few questions. Uh, Sam Raskin from the Post here. Uh, Sam. Yes, so uh, Michael Bloomberg, when speaking about issues that need to be addressed um, in the city, cited um, street homelessness. Um, what is your approach to working with Mayor Bill de Blasio on that matter, and what will you do differently than your predecessor on street homelessness? Well, I will, as you said, work with Bill de Blasio. That's answer number one. And I just was on the phone with uh, Mayor de Blasio probably at 11 o'clock this morning, talking first of all about the immediate crisis. We have new homeless people as a result of the hurricane we all experienced, so it's, it adds to the ranks. There are a number of people who will not be able to go back to their homes, and I don't want them to be homeless. But I'm also going to uh, reinvigorate New York State's commitment to building more affordable and supportive housing. $20 billion is what I'm planning to uh, unleash over the next few years, and literally identify neighborhood by neighborhood what communities need this help the most and how we get that done. That is a longer-term problem, and I tend to not like longer term problems, I like immediate problems, but it's something that is going to define New York and whether or not we're going to have a full recovery and whether or not we're able to take care of people who find themselves on the streets, but also to let people who uh, live and work in New York City know that they're also safe. So it's a, it's a balance. We have to make sure that we're taking care of the human needs of individuals, but also make sure that people feel uh, comfortable that these people actually have a secure place to put their head down at night. Well, it's a program that's run by the city, and if they need additional assistance and support, we'll be happy to work with them. Governor Hochul, two questions. Um, there have been nine deaths on the city jail or in city jails so far this year. Advocates blame it on overcrowding and understaffing. There is a bill that the legislator passed, the Less Is More Act, that would help alleviate overcrowding by letting people who are held on technical parole violations be released. Will you sign the bill? Why or why not? Well, I will certainly look at that bill. I've, I have probably 450 bills that are waiting my uh, signature. I just took care of some very significant ones to help the men and women of labor, and uh, I will absolutely take a serious look at that. I am very concerned about what is going on in our, in our jails, without a doubt. It is, the conditions are inhumane, substandard, and not acceptable in the state of New York. Governor Hochul, you talked about the disparity in vaccination between 12 and 17-year-olds and the rest of the population. Why not do a vaccine mandate, especially now that the main vaccine for that age group, Pfizer, is fully approved, similar to how other school children are required to have other vaccines? That is certainly an option, but I'm also aware that, you know, this is something that parents are very, very anxious about. You know, I want to encourage parents to understand the science and the data that should lead them to the same conclusion we all have, that this is the best thing you can do for your child if you want to protect them from this virus. And we know that children have not been hit as hard as adults, and particularly the elderly, but we also don't have enough knowledge to know the long-term effects if they do contract the virus. I mean, these long haulers, I and mean, what does this do to a child? So I hope that parents can be listening to us in terms of what they need to do which is best for their children but i'm willing to take a look at all options on the table because if these numbers start going up again and we have to figure out a way to contain that or else we're going to end up talking about what happens to school settings and workplaces again i'm i'm not letting the state go back there again so i will take uh, more actions if necessary right now i'm asking parents to do what's absolutely best for their children and if they're between the ages of 12 and 17, get them vaccinated immediately and we'll make it so easy for you. 
Uh, we'll let you know where to go. We'll make sure that you know, if you need some time off work to take your child, that we will make it easy for you. Just do it. With vaccines, are more are back are mass vac sites coming to help with the booster, or are you not quite there yet? No, we're there. You know, we've offered them. You know, we just had a call with the county. I, again, I'm I'm engaging local officials, and to the extent they tell me they want a mass vac site, others are happy to set up their own. They received particularly our larger counties received substantial dollars received substantial dollars from the federal government to deal with COVID, and they're ready to spend it on vaccination sites to get booster shots available as well as drive throughs uh, so I, I it's it's all about a partnership they need me to set up a mass vac site and back on um, you know, Long Island or in Syracuse or in Buffalo I can do it in a, in a couple of days if they're can, they can handle with the resources locally then we'll let them do that Governor, uh, uh, green energy programs and resiliency projects you know they cost billions of dollars uh, we've been looking at climate change since the storm uh, how might this money be raised through uh, taxing greenhouse gas emissions? That's an option, but we also have our Climate Act, which is going to be going before the voters, the, Climate, the Bond Act, which will be on the ballot in 2022. And I, need, I know we need to build a, uh, an advocacy campaign in support of that to unleash the money that's in that bond, which I believe will give us the resources we need to be able to start doing all the resiliency planning that's required. We have a strategy on this, and I know there's, you're, you're, you're suggesting one approach. I'm also suggesting there is another approach on the table, but I am, I am looking at all options right now. Are you supportive of the CCIA? I will be supporting anything that's going to get us to a better place because I don't ever want to witness what I saw in the streets of New York when we had to deal with the ravages of a cataclysmic flooding event, which happened once, it happened 10 days later, and for all we know, it could happen again 10 days from now. So I'm very focused on working with my, my environmental team, talking to the legislators about their plans, and working ultimately with Congress in Washington because this is not going to be solved by New York State alone. We're going to need our federal partners, and I know President Biden spoke about this yesterday. Uh, this is our red alert. This is our, our warning. And so we'll be working. I know how to work with people. Uh, and that's what's going to happen in this case. We're going to have a team together figuring out the best way to go forward. I think we have we have individual. Is that we we have uh, some calls on the line too? Or? Okay. Okay, Zach. Okay, Zach. Let me just ask you regarding this special session uh, that was just recently held in Albany. I know you've tried to make a real break from how the Cuomo administration did business, but it did have a little bit of a feel of kind of the old Albany ways with the secrecy. It was kept from the public till the very last minute. I know you're negotiating with the legislature on the details, but it seemed like the broad strokes, including extending the eviction moratorium, which is so important to so many tenants. Why was that kept so close to the desk? And do you feel as though you want to change that going forward so that the public can be informed a little bit more, you know, earlier than the moment it hits the floor for a vote? I believe the public knew you're spending the days leading up to that eviction moratorium deadline working on this. We absolutely were. We just didn't have the details because they were evolving uh, literally through the night. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, trying to structure a deal so we could have something uh, to put forth. So I don't think there are any surprises that this was the highest priority of my administration. I had said this when I was sworn in, that I want to get this done. We have a cliff. People will fall off this cliff if we don't take action within days. So. I don't agree that there was a surprise element to that. Not knowing the terms, well, the terms were you're either going to extend the moratorium or you're not. And we extended it longer than anyone expected. You know, we have the long, one of the longest extensions in the country of January 15th. That was one of the few details, but I will always be guided by transparency and getting information out as soon as we can in this unique circumstance, which necessitated this extraordinary session of calling back the legislature when they're normally here in January, that we had to get this done. And I don't think there's anybody in the state of New York who benefits from this extension, but also getting that time we need to get the money out because there's still too much money that landlords need and tenants need. And I'm laser focused on this. I met with Catherine Garcia yesterday. She's in charge of this as well as uh, other members of my team to make sure that money gets out. So we can disagree on whether or not it was secret. I think everybody knew what I was working on that weekend. Uh, we have we have some we can, okay we have some uh, people. Thank you very much, Governor. Yes, ma'am. We will now take some questions on Zoom. Reporters, if you could please use the raised hand function at the bottom of your window, and we'll go from there. We'll get the volume up a little bit, right? Okay. 
Governor, your first question comes from the New York Times, Shannon Young. I'm sorry, Politico, Shannon Young. Hey, Governor. Um, just wanted to get some clarification on the New York HERO Act here. The designation is only through the end of the month. Is there a reason why it was uh, that date? And is that enough time for businesses to implement their plans? How will employees report issues with this? Is there a process there? And, and how will the state oversee and enforce the bill? Well, we have more information coming out on that. I'm joined by our Commissioner of Labor, Roberta Reardon, whose team is working closely on the enforcement side, ensuring that uh, everyone is aware. And, we, and I believe in letting employers know our expectations. But this is not a new development. This was signed into law back in May. The effective date was in June. So they've had plenty of time to prepare for this. The only thing that was missing I'm not sure why, but it seemed very simple to me to have the Department of Labor and Department of Health execute the necessity, the necessary language to identify that this is going to go forward. That's all that was missing. So there has not been a surprise. Uh, Commissioner, do you want to add anything about how the enforcement's going to occur and how, and you also asked about the reporting, how someone who's an employee will be reporting uh, any violations. Is that what you asked me? Sure. Ms. Com Commissioner Roberta Reardon. Thank you, and thank you, Governor, for your support throughout this. This has been really remarkable. So uh, we are very excited to uh, be able to enforce the HERO Act. It is, uh, as, as said today, a very, very important uh, piece of legislation to protect all workers and therefore to protect everybody in the state because we all come in contact with them. Uh, we are ready to go out and do the enforcement now that we have the designation that it is, in fact, a pandemic. And workers, if you go on the, work si on the uh, DOL website, there is a whole page devoted to the HERO Act, and there's a lot of information there. And I think it's the same process that you can file any grievance in, you know, with, with the DOL. Contact us, tell us what the issue is and your identification, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Another call in Governor, question. your next question comes from Dan Clark of PBS. Hey, Dan. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? Sure can. All right. Um, so in recent weeks, you used the public health council, the state public health council, to issue those vaccine mandates for healthcare workers. I'm wondering why not use the public health council for more mandates, like a statewide mask mandate reimposed or even more vaccine mandates. And a second question for you, with these staffing shortages at um, healthcare facilities, hospitals, et cetera, with that vaccine mandate, how will the state address what potentially might be even more staff shortages because people obviously won't be able to keep their jobs if they're not vaccinated. Right, right. And what I'm uh, peeling back, Dan, is finding out where we have authority independently, what authority was granted by the executive orders, and what authority is there if we go through the public health council. So what you saw me do this past week was follow the guideline or requirements that we get the sign off from the public health councils. And certainly we'll find out the other areas where that is a necessary step for us to go forward. So I will follow all requirements but also uh, prepared to act decisively on my own when I have the authority to do so. And that right now is not uh, to be able to have ma uh, vaccination mandates. And in terms of this, how, this shortage, and, and it is absolutely, we're gonna hit a crisis level with respect to staffing in healthcare facilities, hospitals, nursing homes. I'm trying to do what I can to work with the unions that represent the current employees, how we can find more people, how we can accommodate their concerns and their needs. I know that there's individuals who are reluctant to get the vaccine who work in these settings. And we have to realize that there's a, a tremendous risk involved when someone who is there to take care of people's health needs, if they too can be carrying the virus. And we went through this last year, it was a real threat and, it, and sometimes there was exposure because of that. But now we have the weapon to fight back, and that is a vaccine. So there may be very narrow accommodations to be made, but I believe that overall we have to make sure that our healthcare workers are vaccinated. Testing can be an option, but I also wanna make sure that they all know that they have to be vaccinated. And um, how we recruit more people, Dan? I am an optimist. I truly hope that people will wanna be part of the, uh, the public health core it's noble work. People saw everybody from our researchers and scientists at Wadsworth uh, trying to identify strains and where they're coming from and how urgent the situation was to the people who work as uh, orderlies or people working in hospitals and transporting people. I hope that, this, that what we saw people come through, not unlike 9-11, 
will inspire this next generation of people to take arms themselves to say, I want to be part of that. And I want to be known for someone who stepped forward when my country and my state needed me the most. I'm sending out that alarm as we speak. I need more people to become health care workers. I've been to many of the workforce development programs. Visited a facility in Batavia, New York at the local hospital. It was a six or seven month training program where someone with a high school degree could get a certificate and literally be able to start going into a healthcare setting. So for people looking to be part of this army and part of this team moving forward, or people just looking for an opportunity because the job they had is no longer there, we need you in healthcare. We need you desperately. We'll make it easy, we'll get you the job, and you'll find it enormously satisfying to help do whatever you can to help your fellow man and woman. And that's, that's exactly what these individuals did over the past year. I think we're all set. Any, one last question? One last question. Yes, Governor, your last question oh. comes from Jimmy Vilkind of the Wall Street okay, Journal. I'll get you that. Hi, Governor. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, so the last guy had lots of plans for New York City infrastructure. He wanted to, uh, you know, take down a block just south of the current Penn Station, put in a new station. He wanted to build an air train from uh, the Met Stadium to LaGuardia Airport. Uh, I'm wondering, who do you plan to appoint to some of these key agencies, the Port Authority, the MTA, uh, whether you're going to leave the current teams in place, and then what deviations, if any, you plan to make on some of these key projects? Well, Jimmy, we're going to be a little more respectful in this environment and not refer to him as the last guy. Uh, that's former Governor Cuomo. And uh, I support many of those projects. There are others that I have questions about. And my early days, I had intense briefings with the leadership of the MTA for starts. As we talked about, you know, my first week on the job, we had this uh, shutdown that occurred on a Sunday night, literally shutting down service uh, through the night and affecting the commute. So I've had meetings with uh, our leadership there. Uh, and I also am meeting with leadership of the Port Authority, and I have confidence in Rick Cotton that he's going to continue to lead, but I'm also very cognizant that there are many people on these boards. Uh, there's some vacancies occurring where I'll be seeking some vacancies where there are different reasons on why they're on those boards, and I'll leave it at that. What I'm going to do is professionalize these boards. I have already asked for the leadership of the MTA, the leadership of the Port Authority, and anyone else who oversees an agency in the state of New York Give me the names of the best and brightest. Tell me who are the most respected in these fields. And I want a diverse group of individuals to represent all New Yorkers, especially people who are the ones who are the consumers of our transportation services, whether it's uh, airplanes, trains, subways, buses. So I'm very focused on that, Jimmy. I'm still in my 40-day window. I granted myself to put together a team. But we're making tremendous progress. And I'm very delighted with the number of individuals who step forward who want to be part of our administration. I'm going to avail myself of their many talents. So we'll be making those announcements uh, once I get some of my, uh, some more of my key cabinet positions uh, vetted and, and approved, and I'll get them in, uh, signed off on. But I believe in big projects. I also uh, know that there's a way we can get it done where we can be collaborative, uh, reach out to people, understand what's going on in neighborhoods, listen to their concerns but also let New Yorkers know we're gonna keep building. We are gonna keep building our way out of this crisis. It's how it's always been done. And the opportunity given to us because of our environmental challenges. You know, Joe Biden said this when we were in Queens yesterday, when he talks about building back and also uh, clean energy and fighting back climate change, he sees one word, it's jobs. I'm the same way. I know there are literally hundreds of thousands of jobs waiting to be had in the state of New York, whether it's offshore wind, Long Island, 10,000 jobs, direct and indirect, that we're waiting to launch with those initiatives, all the way up to uh, uh, our opportunities with battery storage. You know, the southern tier is an, ec uh, an epicenter of battery storage to Niagara Falls and harnessing our hydroelectric power. So I believe that we can do a lot with the, in the energy space, the environmental space, while we're creating more jobs. But those big infrastructures you talk about in the city, I'm, I'm very familiar with all of them, and stay tuned for more announcements on each and every one. Have you made a right. on, uh, on, the, uh, well, on the climate change issue, you know, congestion pricing, the, gov uh, the mayor has called for it to be accelerated. You've said when you've answered questions about this, I believe I have supported it using kind of I, the I past said, tense. I wonder, do, no. you, do you want to accelerate it? Is there a way to accelerate it? And do you support, you know, putting it in place as soon as for 
possible going forward? Yes. I have supported, I do support, and I will support. No question of my support for congestion pricing. And I've already asked the question, how do we reduce the time frame? And I know having done all kinds of projects my entire life, I'm aware of transportation studies, draft environmental impact statements, full EIS statements. I know all the environmental impacts that have to be undertaken. I know what's involved in all these decisions, and they're all required by federal and state law. So I've already asked the question, what, what is the timetable, the shortest timetable that we can follow to get this done legally and properly? And that's the timetable we'll follow. Okay, uh, Projects, do you have questions about specifically the air train? Is that I'm looking closely at the air train. I'm looking at I'm looking at every single project, and I want to know the status. I want to know is there a, a uh, are we going to continue on the current path? Is that the best path forward? Is that what the experts are going to tell me? And also, is there another way to do it? And that's those are the questions that I know you're going to allow me the time to ferret out to make sure we come to the right conclusions. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to rush to judgment. But I also know that these, some of these projects need to happen soon. I want to continue investing in, these, in uh, the tr infrastructure. We have no choice. It's also jobs that we desperately need, particularly as we come out of this pandemic. Last question. Last question. I am making all of my decisions on hiring major positions in the next, within a 40-day, five-day period. So uh, I, I know you're anxious. Um, I'm going to do this, everything I do thoughtfully with input from others, and then I'm very decisive. And I so think Larry, Larry, Schwartz? Larry Schwartz is not part of my administration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.